Greetings, I'm Bill Everett, and welcome to this episode of Chamber Conversations, the piano trio since Beethoven, brought to you by the Friends of Chamber Music in Kansas City. Beethoven is one of those composers whose influence on the Western European-based concert tradition is indisputable. Every composer since Beethoven has had to deal with the legacy of his nine symphonies, 32 piano sonatas, and 16 string quartets, whenever they have written in any of these genres. To this list, we can certainly add the piano trio, works for piano, violin, and cello. Beethoven created seven multi-movement works for piano trio, as well as two variation sets. The piano trio hasn't enjoyed the same level of fame in the classical chamber firmament as its cousin, the string quartet. There are several reasons for this. First, the ensemble, the piano trio, was a relative latecomer to the scene, arriving only in the late 18th century. Second, piano trios were frequently performed in private homes as domestic music making. These were works to be performed by talented amateurs for their own pleasure in front of a small invited audience. It is part of Beethoven's legacy, as far as the piano trio is concerned, that the genre would appear with increasing frequency in concert halls. A third reason concerns instrument technology, especially as it relates to the piano. Thanks to improvements in instrument manufacturing during the 19th century, pianos were able to play louder and with more force. While string instruments also benefited from their own technological advances, they simply couldn't compete with the sheer sound of these new pianos. It thus became essential for composers and performers to figure out how to address the dilemma of ensuring that all three instruments could be heard, and doing this in creative and distinctive ways. We'll begin our discussion of piano trios with those of Beethoven's Viennese contemporary, Franz Schubert. Schubert is perhaps most famous for his leader, or songs, in which he creates an atmosphere in the piano upon which the voice intones the text to a typically lyrical melody. This textural approach also features in Schubert's instrumental music, where he often presents a song-like theme above an atmospheric underpinning. Furthermore, Schubert's music implies a great deal of intimacy, not only among the performers themselves, but also between the performers and the audience. Many of these works received their first performances in private homes, including Schubert's. Such features are evident in Schubert's two large-scale piano trios, written towards the end of his life in 1827 and 1828. These are four movement works in which Schubert's expansiveness concerning musical form and design is clearly evident. Each trio lasts about 40 minutes in performance. In these later works, Schubert addresses the inherent issue of balance between the piano and the strings by often scoring both hands of the piano higher than the registers of the violin and the cello. This technique allows all three instruments to be heard and participate in genuine three-way musical conversations. Here's an excerpt from the first movement of Schubert's first piano trio, in which the piano provides atmospheric underpinning for the exchange of ideas between the violin and the cello, and occasionally contributes its own voice to the proceedings. Four movement piano trios continued to appear throughout the 19th century. These works were envisioned on the same models as contemporary string quartets and symphonies, and they typically exhibited characteristic features of the composers who created them. Such is the case with Felix Mendelssohn. Mendelssohn was a gifted composer, pianist, and conductor 
who sets of pieces for solo piano, songs without words, ensured his popularity in the amateur domestic marketplace. People waited with bated breath for the next appearance of a volume of these songs without words. The qualities of these melody-driven pieces with their immediate appeal became hallmarks of Mendelssohn's style. Mendelssohn was a composer who balanced classical emphasis on formal design and transparent textures with the romantic notions of musical atmosphere and emotional affect. In the second movement of his first piano trio, written in 1839, Mendelssohn demonstrates the essence of his songs without words aesthetic. The melody is stated first in the solo piano, the medium for the songs without words, and is then repeated by the entire trio. Here's the entrance of the strings as they prepare for the trio's statement. Among Mendelssohn's many extraordinary gifts was his ability to create highly idiomatic scherzos, fast-paced movements that, in Mendelssohn's hands, bore an effervescent, almost magical quality that gives them an unmistakable distinctiveness. As a pianist himself, Mendelssohn wrote in such a way that the piano would not obscure the string instruments and thus would emphasize the interconnectedness of the three performers. To experience the wonder of a Mendelssohn scherzo, here's the Griffin Trio performing the third movement of Mendelssohn's second piano trio, Opus 66, completed in April 1845.
This symbiosis between the three members of the trio is also evident in the piano trios by the husband and wife, Robert and Clara Schumann. Clara was considered by many to be the finest pianist of her generation, while Robert achieved fame as a music critic and composer, especially of leader, following Schubert, and works for solo piano. Clara Schumann, in her piano trio from 1846, demonstrates an economy of means in how she achieves balance between the three instruments. Toward the end of the fourth and final movement, she doubles the melody in the violin and the cello, scoring which allows the tune to soar through the piano texture. Her ingenuity is further displayed through slight remembrances of the main theme as the trio reaches its conclusion. Robert Schumann turned to the piano trio relatively late in life and created three works in the genre, all of these coming after his wife's single contribution to the piano trio repertory. In Robert Schumann's trios, fantasy elements that reveal the realm of the imagination are merged with the intellectual rigor of formal design. Schumann was also known for his music criticism. His writings about music and musicians were extremely influential. One person he championed was someone who had become a close family friend, Johannes Brahms, whom Robert Schumann called the Young Eagle. Brahms's first published chamber music work was his piano trio, Opus 8. The work was completed in 1854 when the composer was just 20 years old. Brahms returned to this early trio decades later in 1891 when he revised it by trimming it to about two-thirds of its original length, removing some of its youthful verve and tightening its overall structure. Brahms completed two other piano trios, Opus 87 in 1882 and Opus 101 in 1886. These works are typical Brahms with their rich textures and full-bodied sonorities, perhaps akin to dark roast coffee with its subtle flavors melding one into another. As an example, here's an excerpt of the first movement of the third piano trio, Opus 101. The piano trio took on special significance among Slavic composers as a means to create musical memorials, and thus they often carry an elegiac atmosphere. For example, in Czech lands, Bedrich Smetana's piano trio in G minor from 1855 was written after the death of his daughter Bedrishka, while Antonin Dvorak's piano trio in F minor from 1883 was written following the death of the composer's mother the previous year. In Russia, Peter Ilyich Tchaikovsky wrote his piano trio in A minor in late 1881 and early 1882 in memory of his teacher and friend, Nikolai Rubinstein. In two movements, the second movement is a set of variations, each of which represents one of Tchaikovsky's memories of his mentor. Subsequently, in 1893, Sergei Rachmaninoff wrote his second piano trio in memory of Tchaikovsky. The massive three-movement work lasts about 50 minutes, five zero minutes in performance. Going into the 20th century, the Soviet composer Dmitry Shostakovich dedicated his elegiac second piano trio from 1944 to the memory of his friend, the polymath, composer, and music critic Ivan Solartinsky. The piano trio 
also forms an important part of the French chamber music repertory. A quintessential element of French music is its emphasis on timbre and the distinctive qualities of sound itself. Maurice Ravel's piano trio, featured in the chamber conversation episode La Belle Epoque, demonstrates an effective means of allowing all three instruments to be heard. Ravel reserves the middle range for the violin and cello, scoring the piano in either its upper or lower ranges. In four movements, the first movement is a zortico, a folk dance from the Basque country, the homeland of Ravel's mother. Its metric organization into units of three plus two plus three, di ta ta di ta ta di ta di ta ta gives the movement a rhythmic elegance and dance-like grace. Here's the entrance of the strings in the first movement. In the final and fourth movement, Ravel again demonstrates his ingenuity at handling musical time. Here, he employs quintuple meter, in which he organizes beats into groups of five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, as opposed to the more typical two, three, or four. Furthermore, he broadens his tonal palette to create sonorities that evoke a sense of openness and expanse. Germaine Taillefer was a student of Ravel who forged her own distinctive musical language, one that was filled with rhythmically engaging and exuberant melodies. She was the only woman to be a member of Les Six, the Six, a group of six French-speaking composers that the critic Henri Collet dubbed as having an idiosyncratic aesthetic. This aesthetic was decidedly rooted in the popular vein exuded sophistication, was wholly chic, and would have immediate audience appeal. Taya Fair's piano trio dates from around 1916 or 1917, and thus is a cultural product of the Great War. She revised the work in 1978. In four movements, echoing the monumental piano trios of the 19th century, Taya Fair's trio is far more modest in scope and lasts just under 15 minutes. It represents an economy of means. Nothing is extraneous. Nothing is gratuitous. It is music at its most essential. The detailed compositional dexterity and the highly specific sound world Taya Fair creates from the combination of piano, violin, and cello reflects not only the French penchant for timbre, but also the musical imagination of its creator. Let's now enjoy a performance of Taya Fair's trio by the Morgan Stern Trio.
A composer of some extraordinarily elegant music, the Frenchman Gabriel Fauré wrote only one piano trio, and that was in 1923. It was his penultimate work, only his solitary string quartet followed. The piano trio is characterized by an inherent textural transparency. Song-like melodies, Fauré was known for his melody or French art songs, and a gradual unfolding of musical material. The piano trio scholar Basil Smallman compares it to, quote, a skilled organ improvisation, end quote. Here's an example of that organic blossoming taken from the middle of the first movement. In England, the piano trio found a special place in the realm of the fantasy genre. 
The industrial magnate and chamber music patron Walter Wilson Cobbett strongly promoted the fantasy genre and described what it should be according to his parameters in an article that appeared in the Musical Times in 1911, and I quote, the fantasy was to be performed without a break and to consist of sections varying in tempo and rhythm. In short, to be in one movement form and not to last more than 12 minutes. The parts were to be of equal importance, end quote. To encourage the composition of fantasies, Cobbett organized a series of six competitions that took place between 1905 and 1919. The 1907 competition was for a piano trio in the fantasy mold. First prize went to the violist, conductor, and composer, Frank Bridge. Bridge entered the Royal College of Music as a violin student in 1896, but later changed to composition, where he studied with the eminent composer and pedagogue, Charles Villiers Stanford. This wasn't the only change he made during his studies, for he also began playing viola in the college's orchestra. In his fantasy for Piano Trio, the prize-winning work, there are five sections. Bridge creates musical unity through continual transformations of the work's opening gesture. Here's that rhapsodic beginning. In the 1920s, Bridge changed his fundamental compositional style from the sonorous sounds of late Romanticism, like we just heard, to the more abstract and austere approach of the modernists who wanted to create a distinctive break with the immediate past. Bridge's second piano trio from 1930 consists of four movements, or more specifically, two pairs of two movements. These are unified through recurring, repeating patterns. Here's that trio's opening with its decidedly stark mood and sparse texture. Another notable British composer to write for piano trio was Samuel Coleridge Taylor, whose mother was English and whose father came from Sierra Leone to London to study medicine. He later returned to Sierra Leone. Coleridge Taylor studied at the Royal College of Music where he would have overlapped with Frank Bridge by one year. At that time, Bridge was enrolled as a violin student and not as a composer. Coleridge Taylor wrote two works for piano trio a three-movement trio in E minor in 1893, while he was a student at the Royal College of Music, and then five Negro Melodies in 1906. These are arrangements for piano trio of five movements from his 24 Negro Melodies, originally for solo piano and published in 1904. The final movement of the piano trio in E minor is filled with a youthful exuberance and lively musical dialogues. Here's a sample. Around the turn of the 20th century, piano trios were heard not only in concert halls, but also in restaurants, cafes,
tea rooms, and other public venues. The huge number of ensembles that performed in these spaces offered a variety of repertory, including, but not limited to, arrangements of parlor songs, orchestral and operatic works, as well as short original pieces. More people would have heard piano trios perform in these places than would have attended formal concerts in performance halls. Here's a bit of Jacques Offenbach's Barcarolle from the opera, The Tales of Hoffman, arranged for piano trio in a vintage recording from 1926. Throughout the 20th century, notable composers continued to contribute to the piano trio repertory, including Charles Ives, Amy Beach, Gianfrancesco Malapiero, Joaquin Turina, Rebecca Clark, Roy Harris, Aaron Copeland, Henry Cowell, Earl Brown, Morton Feldman, and many others. In the 21st century, composers continue to write piano trios. Colin Twigg, the first violinist of the Bridge String Quartet and a member of the City of Birmingham Symphony Orchestra, wrote his piano trio in 2004 for the City of Birmingham Symphony Orchestra's center stage chamber music series. Colin's fantasy variations on a theme of Haydn for String Quartet is featured on another chamber conversation, the English fantasy from the 17th through the 21st centuries in a performance by the Bridge Quartet. Collins' three-movement piano trio is replete with contrasting textures, juxtapositions of musical shapes and characters, sometimes in succession and other times simultaneously, and a sense of musical unity that is achieved through the continuous morphing of core melodic materials. Here's an excerpt from the third movement. Chen Yi is one of the leading composers of her generation. She is especially known for her ability to blend Chinese and Western traditions in works that transcend musical and cultural boundaries. Born in Guangzhou, China, Dr. Chen is the Cravens Millsap, Missouri Distinguished Professor of Composition at the University of Missouri, Kansas City Conservatory. She is the recipient of numerous awards, fellowships, and prizes, including the Charles Ives Living Award from the American Academy of Arts and Letters. Chen Yi has composed three works for piano trio, Tibetan tunes in 2006 for the New Pacific Trio, Tunes from My Home in 2008 for the Newstead Trio, and Night Thoughts, originally written for flute, cello, and piano in 2004, and adapted for violin, cello, and piano for the Civitas Ensemble in 2019. All three works are inspired by Chinese culture. For example, the first movement of Tibetan tunes draws inspiration from the Tibetan, a Zhang minority, tune Du Mu. Here, it is played on a Zhongling, a type of flute. In the evocative opening of Tibetan tunes, Chen Yi captures the inherent essence of the folk tune when it appears in the cello. The violin and later the piano provide atmospheric color.
Later in the movement is a captivating dialogue between the three instruments during which they exchange their own versions of the Dumu melody. Throughout this episode, we've heard some innovative and distinctive sonorities and timbres emanating from this combination of piano, violin, and cello. Our final example provides yet another evocative sound world. The second movement of Chen Yi's Tunes from My Home, titled Nostalgia, is based on tunes coming from the Guangdong province in southeastern China. To create the crystalline ending of this delicate movement, Chen Yi scores harmonics in the strings, that is, just touching the string rather than using the finger to fully stop the string, alongside motives that emphasize the lower range of the cello and the upper ranges of the violin and the piano. The piano trio continues to inspire, captivate, and delight composers, performers, and audiences to the present day. Since its origins in the 18th century, its particular timbres and acoustical properties have made it among the most distinctive, challenging, and gratifying chamber ensembles. In this episode, we've heard examples ranging from the sparkling lightness of Mendelssohn and the sonic fullness of Brahms, to the immediate melodic appeal of Tai Affair and the evocative Chinese-inspired sound worlds of Chen Yi. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Chamber Conversations, the Piano Trio since Beethoven, brought to you by the Friends of Chamber Music in Kansas City. Until next time. Mm -hmm.